I'm uh, about to head into surgery. Um, turns out I had uh, two of the three hamstring tendons rip off during the jump. So far I hadn't really had time to think about what happened. Um, I don't think I wanted to either, but anyway, I don't have a choice but go into surgery. Um, I'm in Turku, Finland at the moment, where one of the bigger specialists for these kind of injuries is. And in about an hour's time, I'm going into surgery and he'll be reattaching the tendons to my sitting bone. And then I'll have to start rehabbing. Um, well, first I'll have to start resting. It's about three to six weeks of almost no activity while the tendon heals. And then slowly I've got to start again. So, not really the Olympics I had imagined it would be. <laughs> um, Yeah, very, very bleak. I don't know what else to say. Just very bleak. And I hope my confidence in competing, or at least in feeling safe on a track, is going to return. because that is something at the moment that I can't really imagine. So, well, let me get ready. And just gotta get through this period. That's it. <laughs> was in the operating room yesterday was the first time it really hit me that this was really serious and if I look at the post-op treatment yeah, then that just scares me um, I can start doing light stationary biking after about eight weeks alter g running two and a half to three months four to five months before i can do 
submaximal running, light sprinting, weight training. Um, and five to six months before I'll be able to do full sprints or at least some sort of full training schedule. Um, obviously depending on how rehabilitation goes, if everything goes well. But you, those are numbers that are hard to comprehend at the moment. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that means that it'll be next year before I will be putting in any anything resembling to proper decathlon training. Whew. That is a hard pill to swallow, I'll be honest. Okay, I am finally recording this. I have been putting off recording this for as long as I could. Mostly because it's pretty uncomfortable talking about trauma and the disappointment and embarrassment and pain that came with the Tokyo Olympics. It was my girlfriend who kept insisting that I finish this uh, because this is a story worth telling. So here I am. It was also her who picked up her phone to film my first bit of rehab. And later on, she learned to use my camera and film most of my training sessions and most of the progress that you're going to see throughout this series. Not only did she keep up with my tired and grumpy ass all year, she was the one that made sure that this project didn't go MIA. A talk about everyday heroes. But what is this? Why am I making a six part series when I could have gotten away with making some Instagram posts or some stories about how I'd be back on track and how everything's going well and I'll see you guys in the summer. And the reason is twofold. First of all, because I think social media is cheap. Not that I wanna bash social media. Social media is a great platform to communicate and share things. It's just not a great one for connection. And I want the medium that I use to communicate that I put in effort, that I spent time and energy on making this, that I wrestled with the subject matter to give you a concise and consistent message. Not only that, it keeps me accountable to communicate properly and it signals to you that more than likely I truly believe what I'm saying. Otherwise, I wouldn't be putting in all this effort. So in an attempt to stay away from empty platitudes on pretty backgrounds, here I am sitting in front of you, alone and vulnerable, sharing as best I can about my experience. The second part has to do with something I noticed after my injury. I was looking for stories to inspire myself and motivate myself and to truly believe that I could make this comeback. But there wasn't that much to find. And that is a real shame because these stories are everywhere in track and field. Last year we had Katrina Johnson Thompson who eight or nine months after rupturing her Achilles was back performing at the Olympics. In Belgium we've had people like Elena Berings who tore her ACL multiple times and came back to her best level. We had decathlete Niels Pittenvils who tore his ACL and last year scored a PB. In Germany, there was Arthur Abele who tore his Achilles, uh, went on to score PBs and even win the European Championships. But there's so many more. There was Teddy Tamgo, Carolina Kluft, Wade Van Niekirk. In Great Britain, there's a sprinter called James Ellington who had a horrendous scooter accident. And he's been working his way back over the years to now be very close to his best level. And I think we're doing the world a great disservice by not sharing these stories because we are in the unique position to have the physios, the doctors, the know-how, the time and energy to show people that after an injury, after an accident, you can heal so much more than you think. And that it's not just about getting functional again, but that for most injuries, it's about being as good or better than you were before. And that is what I want to show with this series that if you put in the time and effort and consistency that you can really get much further than you imagined and that is something I'm really passionate about and that is something that I hope I can show in this series. All right on to the main thing of the injury because it's important to know why or how I got injured and what the eventual medical verdict was and I'll talk a little bit about my own experience first. I remember running up 
And in my first run up, I felt a sort of cramp in my hamstring and I kind of stretched it, felt it out and it felt okay. So I walked back and decided to just go for uh, my second attempt. And I got up to the board and I thought, okay, I've got great speed. Let's just make it a good jump. And instead of popping off the board, it felt like I got hit by a truck. And I don't even remember hitting the sand. The first thing I remember is a Japanese official trying to help me up and I signaled that I needed some time. And I bent my leg to feel if it was still working. And eventually I rolled out of the sand pit because there were other decathletes that needed to jump. So, And looking at the video images afterwards, there was a moment where my brother asked me um, if I was okay. And I said, my knee, I hurt my knee. So clearly in the beginning, I didn't really realize what had happened. And I didn't realize what had happened until a week later when I was awaiting my surgery in Finland. I got a message from... A javelin thrower and he said hey I hope uh, you're going to make a full recovery I know it sucks um, I was also slipping during my javelin competition and I didn't really know what he was talking about because I hadn't followed anything after my injury and I went on his Instagram page and I saw he had made a post of all the javelin throwers kind of slipping and sliding and not being able to throw properly and right at the end of that post there was kind of a zoomed in image of my leg and my foot um, slipping through the track and then sort of twisting out and I hadn't looked at the images yet and I hadn't seen especially hadn't seen uh, multiple angles of my jump so I decided to do some digging I went online and this is what I found okay let's have a look at the mechanics of my injury because this sort of injury is pretty rare so it might be interesting to understand how it happened or why and if you look at my full jump you can't really see that much because the camera's panning along with the jump, so you don't get the sensation of which body parts are accelerating or decelerating. But thanks to a German guy on Twitter, I found a frontal view, and once you line up the side view and the frontal view, it gets a bit more interesting because we can see where I hit the board. And I thought I had just square hit the board and then slid over it, but that wasn't entirely the case. Here I have the spike that I used for this exact jump and I haven't touched it since the games. I just took it off in the infirmary and that was it. And we can actually see from the spike where I hit the board because it's kind of hard to see on the images. They're fairly low quality and the frontal view where you could see the board um, has like wide angle distortion. So it's hard to say. But interestingly, I've got plasticine around the front of my spike, but the base of the spike only catches plasticine a little bit further down and that means that I hit the board right at the end so this spike must have scrubbed the back of the plasticine and then my full foot hit the board right about here which means that I still had quite a few spikes right in there so I must have just slipped through that board like it was nothing and then you can see there's some extension over my shoe uh, of more plasticine but if you look at the images all right so right here as I plant my foot you can all of a sudden see that my foot starts accelerating forward. And this is the moment where my knee starts bending backwards. So now we gotta ask, first of all, why would I slip that badly on a board? It's, it's kind of weird, it shouldn't happen. Um, but why did that knee then bend backwards? And it's kind of hard to know, but m my theory is that as I hit the board with my spikes, I had enough traction for my leg to start buckling. So all the muscles tense to kind of catch all that force and then jump over it. So that means that there was enough downward pressure already engaged to do the jump, um, but my foot didn't have enough traction to stay in the right place and started sliding. And then it's very hard to know at which point my hamstring would have snapped. Um, you can see as I keep sliding through the track and through the track, at a certain point, my ankle rolls. So I think it's a miracle that my knee didn't break backwards but maybe because that ankle was able to roll and kind of release a lot of the energy that was stored in my leg, maybe that kind of saved me in a sense. But then you can see I get launched forward and uh, yeah, it's not a pretty sight. And it's difficult to see on these images exactly how far I'm sliding. But if we look at the following jump, which was Damien Warner, by the way, 
and he just saw someone end his career and still jumped a 20 which is pretty insane but anyway if we look at his takeoff foot you can see the mark that i made in the track which is quite long um, again it's a wide angle of the takeoff board so it's kind of hard to see how long it really is but if we look at the aerial view you can see how long that line is so i must have been sliding through the track about 50 centimeters it seems like uh, before i finally i was finally able to dissipate the forces and land in the sand pit so i was transported straight to the olympic village where they have a medical center and that's where uh, they took these mris and you can see here the light gray substance is um, normal muscle tissue and then the white is blood or fluids um, you can see here on the outside the bicep femoris and then the semitendinosus is more on the inside um, and if you want to see how that looks in real life this uh, is my leg about six days after the injury i'd been wearing a band so that the blood wouldn't sink down too much and that's the bruise that was left on my leg so now that we know how the injury happened and you kind of understand the anatomy of it um, I'm gonna leave it to my brother and my sister to explain what happened in Tokyo because for me the memories are kind of fuzzy and uh, they have a much clearer picture of the days following. So here they are. Our preparation for 2021 went really, really well. Um, we started off not really hard and kind of eased into it um, because we came in 2020 out of a very strange season. Uh, but it really gave us the time to do some other stuff and in 2021 take our time to really build and grow into the season. And So by, by the time we needed to do our first competition, which was uh, in Goetzes, and that was in the end of May, uh, we knew Thomas was already in very good shape. Uh, so we didn't really push it. We just wanted to see, okay, what, what is he capable of doing there? What do we need to work on? Uh, but he came back with a personal best and then I knew like, okay, we have two months uh let's not overdo it but let's slowly start building up to these games so eventually we traveled to japan everything went really well that training camp was fantastic i think you you can kind of have a feel with athletes when they are reaching like their absolute best and you you try to hold them back a little bit um, but still he was in training doing record after record and then you know okay he's he's ready to do to go for it and to do something special uh, but you more or less want to hold them a little bit back for the big moment. So I remember in the stadium, because of COVID, there were not a lot of people there. So the stadium was very, very quiet. And while I was watching the warm-up of all the long jumpers, you could very well hear uh, the takeoff, which is normally something that you don't hear as well. Uh, coaches are, are used to listening to it in training, but in a big stadium, it's, it's a little bit hard. And uh, I remember when... Thomas did his run up and his jump that instead of hearing like a pop up off the board, I really hear it like a slit and I saw him fall and I really immediately knew, okay, this is, this is not going to be good. So I was really stunned to see what had happened and then how quickly I realized how serious it was. Uh, and I remember looking at, at Michal and I urged him to, to go over and see you and, and um, initially I wanted Michael to encourage you to get up and go back and jump again um, but then you know quickly you realize this is very serious and we are out of this decathlon um, and it's done. You, you kind of want to go and, and run towards your athlete and like check if everything is okay. But at the games, there was a big gap between the stadium and the track, so that's not possible. So I, I actually went straight away to the team doctor uh, and together we went uh, underneath the stadium to find the medical area. But again, because of COVID, it was very strange. There were not a lot of people around. Normally you would also be briefed or go around the stadium beforehand, but we couldn't do that. So we actually didn't know where the medical post was. So things go to your, to your head uh, and kind of a, a strange feeling because you know immediately it, it's done. This competition is over. Uh, and so all that anticipation and all the uh, energy that you slowly build up over a couple of weeks uh, to be ready for this competition suddenly together with the jump kind of explodes and that energy is gone. 
Uh, and that's it's a very strange feeling, even for a coach. Um, it's not what you expect. In my mind, I was just hoping that maybe it wasn't that bad or maybe uh, he can still return into competition. Uh, a, a lot of thoughts that protect you from that realization that you have just lost uh, something big. So eventually we managed to find the, the, the medical rooms and the medical offices um, and they sent us straight away to Thomas. Uh, we found him there. Uh, and it was, I've seen many, many injuries, and especially uh, Thomas has been injured quite a few times. Uh, so I can kind of get the atmosphere how bad it is. And, and this one was, was really not good. He was in a lot of pain. Um, he was laying there. He was a little bit confused himself as well. Uh, and we were really trying to figure out what the next step was. Uh, very funnily, the, the Japanese came with a booklet with all the next steps that you need to do. So they were ticking boxes. But for us, it was taking so long that we were asking, what, what are we actually doing here? Um, but there were not a lot of people that spoke English. And it's one of those situations that you're in a foreign country and you're kind of, um, you try to communicate, but it doesn't really work very well. But they took uh, very good care of Thomas and eventually we got him uh, on a stretcher brought him to the ambulance and we drove back to the Olympic Village. Uh, and during the Olympic Games, they actually built a whole uh, medical center like a hospital. So I, I think Thomas was very lucky to be dropped off straight, get the scans, uh, get some specialists involved. Uh, we had our, our, our team attaches or team doctors with us. And um, the Diagnose and uh, the follow-up, the immediately follow-up was very, very quick, very high quality, very high standard. But so we figured out very quickly that the that it was a hamstring avulsion. Uh, Thomas was very quickly discharged because it's not a life-threatening injury or something like that. Um, but so we brought him back in a wheelchair to his room. Uh, I kind of dropped him off there. Uh, kind of a sad moment because he, he, he was the only one there. I think he went to his room, laid in his bed, and I don't know what he did, He'd probably stare at the ceiling and figure out what, what, what had happened. So I dropped him off, I, I left him there. Um, I went back to my sister and, and got to work to find a solution with, uh, with our team. So within a few hours, we, we were already looking for uh, the right people and the right doctors to help Thomas. And, and I started to ask around and I got a few names. And I also contacted Dr. Lasse Lempainen, who's uh, a major specialist and who has worked with many professional athletes. Um, so I just reached out through his website, filled in his contact page, and uh, Dr. Lempainen was so kind to reply to us immediately. And he said that he had seen the injury, that he was aware of what had happened, and that basically he was expecting a call um, to, for us to reach out and um, get his services. Eventually... Thomas went through his operation and uh, I remember coming, coming back to, to Belgium and getting off the plane, uh, literally rolling him off the plane, uh, getting back home and, and dropping him off. Uh, and then you do get the realization of like, oh, what now? Uh, we had been working, especially in Olympic Games, the, the last few months, it's, it's kind of takes a lot of mental space. And then for it to be suddenly over uh, without having a very good result, so to speak of, uh, but also being in a situation that, that you don't really know, okay, what is, what is going to be the next steps now? Is he going to have it in him to continue or is, is this the end? Yeah, so after the, the dust was settled a little bit and Thomas had his operation, um, I needed a break. Uh, as much as Thomas needed a break, so I took a couple of weeks off. So by the time I came back, uh, he had done something, but I could feel that there was not, not really motivation. The question as well, if, if he would start or try to start his season again uh, in a couple of weeks, which we normally did, uh, was clearly that he, he really didn't want to do that and, and, and have some mental space and some time 
to see where he's really at and to make a decision if he wanted to continue his career. The first few weeks were very depressing. I'm used to seeing a Thomas that is always moving, always doing things, reading, playing with my children, competing, training. Every day he's doing things. So now I saw a Thomas that was just in bed or in the couch, not doing anything, feeling lost. Um, and as a sister, that's tough to see because... Um, you, you, you know, you always want the best for the people around you. And clearly Thomas was in a very depressed state, <laughs> just not being able to do anything, not emotionally and not physically. Um, so it came to me as a relief after like the first six weeks, I could see that Thomas could move around a little better. And I think with that physical movement also came you know some improvements in that depressive state that he had been in since the olympic games okay. all right so after the surgery i was dropped at home and that's sort of where the emptiness started for me i didn't know what to do with myself i was still in a lot of pain i wasn't mobile i i didn't know what to think about what happened and Clearly not the best period for me, both mentally and physically, but after a little while, the first milestones start coming around. And the first one is kind of lame because you get your stitches removed, but it does mean that you're sort of on this path of recovery. And so I was kind of happy that the first one came around, sort of uh, excited that I could kind of check it off my list. All right. It's been 11 days since the surgery and we've reached the first little milestone today, which is that my stitches are getting removed. I've got my private chauffeur, my mom taking me there because I still can't drive or do much in any case, um, but I'm glad that they're going. I've been having uh, a lot of itching, a lot of pulling from them in the last few days. So it'll be good that they're gone. It's time. So, yeah, that's uh, milestone number one, I guess. Not that I've had to do much, but celebrate every, every step of the way, I guess. <laughs> All right, so that's that. Stitches are gone. And probably from next week on somewhere, I'll be able to start treating this car so the skin smooths out nicely and uh, doesn't start pulling when I do bigger movements with my leg so so now we rest some more <laughs> it's a few more weeks before I can start uh, doing any sort of training or exercises so going home resting some more and then I can't wait until I can actually do something about my situation instead of just waiting and lying around. Um, but yeah, gotta just go with whatever's happening now. Okay, okay, I know. Getting your stitches removed is sort of a lame milestone, but it did signal the start of this rehab process and the next milestone was a lot more exciting because it meant I could leave my crutches behind and start walking again. And at this point me and my girlfriend decided that I needed a break and that we needed to get out of the house. So we grabbed the car and drove down south. All right, we are at four weeks from surgery. And the last few days I've been mostly hanging out in the forest, because last week I just had the feeling that I had to get out of my house and I needed some downtime or nature time. Um, and my girlfriend is visiting. She finally got her visa from South Africa, so 
we are exploring the Semois Valley, which is probably my favorite place in Belgium. While we've been doing that, I've been doing more and more exercises, um, also more and more learning to walk again. When you have to think of doing something, you always automatically do. It's super weird. And I've actually noticed that on uneven terrain, walking feels much more natural because you're not thinking about walking, you're just looking at where your feet go. Um, so maybe there's a lesson in there, <laughs> I don't know. Um, still cannot do a lot. Um, obviously the hamstring is still weak, but also my knee is still sore. I like that I can walk around again. Um, being immobile drives me nuts. So <laughs> I'm glad that that is over. I feel like this downtime has done me well. Um, I still don't know how to feel about what happened during the Olympics. And I can feel my mind wanders a lot. Um, so I don't know when the moment is going to be where that confrontation is going to come. If it's ever going to come, who knows. I look forward to the coming weeks just getting better. It just sucks when your body just doesn't cooperate. But hey, four weeks down. However, many more to go. <laughs> All right, so that's walking checked off. And this one was really exciting for me because it meant that I could start taking my girlfriend around the country and she had never been here before, so I was very excited to take her to Ghent, which is where I grew up, and then other cities like Bruges and Antwerp. And obviously at first we took it slow. She was very worried about my legs, so we started with a few hours, then we went out half a day, and eventually after a few weeks we were going out all day, you know, doing museums and visiting churches and walking up the belfry. And in that way I sort of did my rehab very naturally i would you know when i was going up the, the stairs i would kind of focus on on making it an exercise instead of just walking up the stairs but i wasn't really interested in going into a gym and rehabbing uh, the way that you're supposed to uh, i was still seeing the physio at this point uh, mostly because he's a really good friend and i sort of see it more as catching up with a friend instead of having to do rehab so that was a big advantage for me and uh, he kind of trusted me enough that I would be smart enough not to do too much or do the wrong things or push myself too much. That way I was sort of enjoying my time much more and I was getting the input that I needed to heal. Then next on the list was biking. And I was really excited for biking because I bike around a lot as a mode of transportation and I just really enjoy the freedom that a bike offers but obviously the doctor wanted me to start on the stationary bike and I did for a few days and then you know pretty quickly I got on my normal bike which maybe I shouldn't have done but I was very careful and it really made me feel so much better I felt free again I felt like I had more opportunities and it's my favorite way of visiting cities so um, we started cruising through Ghent and Bruges and you know it was just a great time to get my mind off things and and kind of bridge this period between sort of initial rehab and starting to train again. About two months after the surgery, I was doing some more substantial rehab sessions once in a while. I think my physio understood that I was having none of it at, the, at that time. And he started taking me out to the forest and treating me outside and taking me to the beach and just kind of enjoying the time outside because he realized that when I was outside, it's just sort of natural for me to move. And instead of putting me in the gym, he took me to the beach and brought a beach volleyball. And we were just kind of figuring out what I could do and what I enjoyed doing um, instead of, you know, hitting reps and, and hitting weights. And that just that was just something that at that time I, I really wasn't interested in. But I'm really thankful that my physio kind of caught on to where I was at, especially mentally and that he came with solutions so that 
you know, I, I was still moving and I still gave myself a shot in case I did want to continue with my sport and did want to continue with my career. <laughs> de operatie was uh, vrij goed verlopen, dat was een zeer ernstig hamstringletsel. Uh, maar helaas waren er ook uh, secundaire problemen. Dus de secundaire problemen lagen dan voornamelijk in de knie en in de enkel. Dus op dat litteken konden we toch niet veel doen, dus we moesten die knie en die voet zo rap mogelijk in, in, in orde brengen. Om, omdat in het latere proces dat mocht geen vertragende factor zijn. Thomas is nogal vrij tolerant naar mij toe en ik mag mijn ding doen. Maar mentaal voelde ik, ik het was een opdracht voor hem voor alles opnieuw te beginnen. Er was uh, wat een ding al gebeurd in het verleden en er moest weer, ik kende de revalidatie, er was weer Hans opnieuw beginnen. En dat is iets dat zeer moeilijk ligt, niet alleen bij Thomas, maar bij verschillende atleten. En dan bouw ik dat stuk op stuk op en dan probeer je prikkels te zoeken om, om je atleet te motiveren. Kleine prikkeltjes. En ja, moet je eerlijk zeggen, goh, dat is nog vrij goed gelukt. We hebben een beetje oefeningen gedaan op strand, op, in het bos. Allee, we hebben een beetje creatiever geweest dan uh, gewoonlijk. En wat is het verschil dan met die kanker? Wel, hij heeft, een, hij heeft een boek al geschreven, Back on Track. En hij wou, hij wou uh, per se terugkomen. Hij wou terugkomen, hij wou bewijzen aan, uh, aan mensen die kanker hebben, misschien... Een stuk ode aan zijn vader, die ook kanker gehad heeft, voor te zeggen, ik ga vechten, ik kom terug. En helaas heb ik dat niet gezien. Dat vechten was er niet. Nu. Hij was, hij was niet aan het vechten. Nu, nu was, hij was gewoon aan het ondergaan. En het was zo van, we gaan het wel zien. Allee, hij heeft er misschien duizend vragen over gesteld, maar het was een moment van, ik zal wel zien hoe, gaan we het, hoe, hoe ver dat mag raken. En hij zocht, uh, we hebben dan een beetje voor alternatieven gezocht. Uh, zijn vriendin is uh, hier naar België gekomen. En dat was eigenlijk een ideale reden voor hem om uh, een keer België te gaan bezichtigen. Hè. Ik moet geen step-up doen als je op de trappen loopt van Belfort. Dus uh, hij heeft zijn eigen een beetje gerivaliseerd uh, urban, zal ik maar zeggen. Van nature uit, allee, ik weet niet of je de verhalen kent van, van Thomas, maar die springen uit het raam en zo van kleins af aan. Dus die zijn niet zo conventioneel met bewegen. Dus uh, ik moest hem wel een beetje onder controle houden. En van te zeggen, ja, we zouden toch beter een dag rust nemen of een keer uh, op het gemak ergens gaan zitten. Uh, is ook een keer plezant. Auw. Auw. Zie maar dat was Ja, dat is true. But you did plan your whole body. Ja. Yeah. De reden waarom dat men niet altijd in de oefenzaal geweest is, uh, goh, is tweerlei. Uh, ik, uh, ik moet buiten zijn, want goh, ik ben ook geen mens om binnen te zitten en ik moet ook getriggerd worden. Maar mentaal, uh, goh, Thomas zit hier dan naar die gewichten en al te kijken. Dat is precies zo van die, oei, wat, wat, wat ga hij met mij doen? Dus hij had er een degoe aan van die gewichten. Dus hij moest, die, die, dat stoorde hem, dat dat, oei, nee, nee, nee. Dat, allee, die gewichten was... Uh, Revalidatie, verplichte revalidatie. Je moet dat doen nu en tien keer dat en tien keer dat. Ik heb er eigenlijk niet voor gekozen. Ik heb gewoon geluisterd naar dat lichaam en stap voor stap en me geprobeerd dat lichaam te triggeren en te verbeteren. Niet meer reeks van 3 x 10, 3 x 15, 3 x 12. Nee, gewichtje bij. Nee, dat hebben we niet gedaan. We hebben gewoon gekeken. Wat zijn de mogelijkheden in de natuur? En dan zijn we daar. Dan zijn er veel ruimer en vrijer in. En dan luister je beter naar je lichaam. En dan doe je de andere dingen. En dan wordt het toch geprikkeld. En dan wordt die spier geprikkeld. En dan wordt dat lichaam geprikkeld. En hier zouden we dan met reeks gezeten hebben. Ik zie hem al toekomen. Dus van 3 x 15. Ja, het is hier gedaan zeker. Ja, allee. Nee, zo hebben we niet willen werken. We hebben naar het bos geweest. We hebben een uur, een uur en een half, twee uur misschien getraind. Speelde geen rol. We hebben gewoon bezig geweest om dat lichaam te activeren.
was a younger man I thought the pain of defeat would last forever But now I don't know what it would take to make my heart back down Cause I only have to wait a little while Before I get mine